Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think a lot of students kept the best for last and uh, tried to be as little in number as possible in the last class. So, mashallah, that's a beautiful ending. So happy, alhamdulillah. Um, okay, so uh, with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, I asked people to bring uh, tart and cake. I don't know if you did, I did. I brought two nice tarts. So at, during the break, you can go for them. One is cheesecake with strawberries and the other is with banana. So um, at least, inshallah, this is a way I can show my appreciation of you being present during uh, these classes, inshallah. So I don't know if there will be sufficient for everybody. Zander noch dacht of zander te Was is that? Yeah? Okay, perfect. Thank you everybody that took uh, something uh, and with them today, and also those who didn't, no problem. This is a, a part of believing that others will. Huh? <laughs> Waiting for others to do it is a part of husnad van, of thinking positively, so there's no problem at all. Okay, so you shouldn't feel bad at all. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, um, uh, inshallah, Allah, there are three things that we take away, or well, four things that we take away from Surah Al Asr. There are four things that we take away from Surah Al Asr, which is knowledge, practice, or sorry, know, practice, preach, endure. Know, practice, preach, endure. Be steadfast. Huh? So these four things are the pillars of the life of a Muslim. Four things. Why? Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in Surah Al Asr. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر. Allah swears by the time and says everybody is in loss apart from those who believe and believing is not without knowing. You can't believe if you don't know. You first need to know and then you need to believe. Okay. Apart from those who believe, يعني know and believe. Those who perform good deeds. Those who invite towards the truth. And do those who are patient. So these four things are the methodology of a Muslim in his life. I'm sorry, I take off my shoes. I do this very often uh, while I give a class. I, I have this from Jordan. And since then, because we were in the desert and the sand. And this is where, <laughs> where I became a Muslim with my feet in the sand, memorizing Quran. So even at university, I sometimes do this. You can, can you imagine? Your, I shouldn't, but it's a, it's a habit. Here I can because it's a mosque. So now at university, I don't do this anymore because people are looking, what is he doing? That's especially when I just came back from Jordan, you know. I, I was in, jo in Sudan, then I went in Jordan, uh, to Jordan, was there for seven years and a half, then I came back. And I, I really turned into a Bedouin, you know. There, there was nothing Belgian in me anymore apart from my blue eyes, <laughs> you know. And so that was it. So when I came back, I really had to assimilate. I had to adapt myself to my own country. So anyway... Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, these four pillars, Imam Shafi'i, Rahimahullah Azza wa Jalla said, لَوْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا هَذِهِ سُورَةَ لَكَثَتْهُمْ أَنِ النَّرِيشَنَ لَوَسِعَتْهُمْ If Allah would have only revealed the, this surah, then it would have been sufficient as an argument. Now, as, a, as an argument, it would have been sufficient. Not meaning that all the rest which was revealed wasn't needed. It means as a methodology, a vision and a way of life. Because all of the other ayat in the Qur'an can be traced back to these four things. To believing, to putting into practice, to preaching and endurance. Yeah? So everything in all the Qur'an can be what? Retraced or connected to one of these four things, or all of them together. So this is very important. So Surah Al Asr is, is something I want to mention because it, it was the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His life was practicing Surah Al Asr in every part of his life, and in words and in deeds. So his belief would not only show by because belief is not something you can see if. If I and uh, if, if our brother and you and you would sit here in front of us, we wouldn't see what someone's belief would be. 
with me for the moment we might with my this and that but I could also be just someone liking Moroccan clothes and being not a Muslim at all so believe is in need of a proof is that clear? Yani, believe is in need of a proof what do I mean? it is through words or deeds and the words that are a proof of your belief is obedience and staying away from disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that this is how we show our, uh, our environment, not for the sake of showing them, that we have a certain kind of belief. Okay? So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal Asr, He swears by Al Asr. The scholars differ about what Al Asr is. Is it Salat Al Asr? Or is it merely the time? Yani, Al Asr also means the time in general. The time. Or does it mean the time of Asr, but not the prayer of Asr? There is a very important uh, principle with regards to tafsir which says لا يجوز تقييد ما أطلقه الشارع meaning if one word in the Quran has more than one possible meaning and they are not in contradiction to one another then all of its meanings are meant. Is this clear? So in the Quran when you see a word and this word is ambiguous, it's not straightforward, it has more than one meaning, and these meanings are not into contradiction with one another, then all of these meanings are intended. Because otherwise you will restrict the, the meaning of the Qur'an or of a word to your own understanding. Do you understand? Like, if there is no straightforward proof from the Qur'an or the Sunnah explaining that particular word, then eventually it's your philosophical approach or linguistic approach that will define how you understand the verse. And this can't be obli- obligatory upon other people apart from yourself. So for example, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَا The scholars differ. Are it the camels or are it the horses? Well, if there is no straightforward proof, and in the Arabic language it's used for camels and for horses, what are we going to say? It can be camels and it can be horses. Why do we need to choose one? Because this is ikhtilaf, it is a difference which leads to a broader, understa- broader understanding of the Qur'an. So we're not going to limit any, uh, the Qur'an to our own understanding if there is more than one possible interpretation. So now this is the same with al-asr. When we say al-asr, it can mean that Allah swears by the time. It can also be that Allah swears by salat al-asr. Why Salat al-Asr? Well, Salat al-Asr, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said that Salat al-Asr is the Salat that the most of munafiqeen nam delay until right before Maghrib. Nam, so so the Salat al-Asr say when it's almost time for Maghrib, they will pray Asr. Why is this? Because usually it's during the day. And Asr is a prayer which many people that do not pray in the mosque find very difficult to pray on time. Because it's something you delay. Because you're busy with your daily routine, your job, your work. So Asr. I wait until Maghrib. So now Salat al-Asr, the Messenger وسلم, said, and someone who has missed Salat al-Asr is like someone whose wealth and health and family have been destroyed. What does this mean? Like if... It has been destroyed. This is how one should feel when one misses Salat al-Asr. If we do, that's another thing. Because we all have our spiritual problems. But on the other hand, we, don't, we should feel like this. It would be the same. Like missing Salat al-Asr, you should have the same feeling as someone coming back home today and seeing that his son or daughter or son and daughter, or sons and daughters, or sons or daughters, all the possibilities. So, we're destroyed, that his house is destroyed, and his wealth is gone. Goes to his account, hacked, all money is gone. How would you feel? Well, this is how you should feel when you miss Salat al-Asr, says the Prophet ﷺ. So, this is also why, uh, one of the reasons why they say that Salat al-Asr is this important, is because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah حَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاتِ الْوُسْطَانِ Hold on to the prayers and the middle prayer and the scholars differ is the middle prayer Fajr because it's in the middle of two prayers during the day and two prayers during the evening or is it Salat Al-Asr because it's in the middle of two prayers during the day as well because Fajr is after sunrise right 
and it is between Maghrib and Isha, which is after sunset. So this would be the middle. So the scholars differ. Anyway, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either swears by the time or either swears, swears by Salat al Asr. Or either by the time of Salat al Asr, because this is the time where a lot of people are um, occupied with worldly affairs. Okay? So now what we need to know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears, swears by something, and He's the only one who is allowed to swear by His creation. So what we are not allowed to do is to say, uh, I swear on, by the grave of my grandmother. I swear by the head of my, my father on the life of my... We might do this, but in reality, this is not allowed. No, this is not allowed. Why? Because swearing in the time of the Arabs was a form of ta'zim. Was a form of glorifying someone. So swearing, not, not insulting, swearing by something would be a form of worship. And this is why swearing by others wasn't allowed those days. If we were to say now, I swear by my mother, but I wouldn't declare the grave of my mother to be holy, neither to have an effect on what I am saying, then it would still be strongly disliked, but would not be considered that shirk. Because worship is not intended. Okay? So, and this is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, like in the Sunan of Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he said, Man halafa bi ghayrillahi faqad kafara aw ashraq. Someone who swears by others than Allah has committed uh, shirk or disbelief. Why? Because in those days it was a form of, of worship. Swearing by something showed that you consider this something that you or someone you were swearing by to have an influence on your life on your risk, on your health, on your wealth, and so much more. So we need to, to place this in a correct context. Okay? Understand this in a correct uh, context. So, well, asr, inna insana lafi khusr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the time. And then, as we said, we are not allowed to swear by anything apart from Allah. The question, are we allowed to swear by the Qur'an? Yes. But not by the Mus'haf. Mus'haf in the Arabic language means... The two covers and the papers. That's Mus'haf. That's man-made. Qur'an is Kalamullah. It's Allah's word. So swearing by His word is permitted. But swearing by creation isn't. Is this clear? So yes, we are, uh, we are uh, allowed to do this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by His creation all the time. Wadduha. By the night. By the day. By the sunset. By the soul. By... But he only swore by one human being, and that was Muhammad He said, I swear on your life that this and this and this. So, and this is a ta'zim. This is because he held Muhammad very high. So why am I saying all this? It will become clear. We want to make clear that there is a vision behind Surah Al-Asr, which the Messenger of Allah lived up to, but I'm going for 10 minutes over an explanation of the Surah. Okay. So now... We, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna al-insana, inna is very, verily. Lafi, the lamb here is to emphasize on it. So, inna is to emphasize. La is also to, to emphasize. Al inna al-insana, lafi khusr. Verily, the human being is in loss. He, 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 he is heading towards destruction, self destruction. And Al-Insan, Abdullah ibn Abbas says, without regards it being a Muslim or a non-Muslim, every human being is in loss. Unless that he or she has four characteristics. And these characteristics are mentioned. Apart from those who believe, and we said belief is based on knowledge. Those who practice, and yani put their knowledge into practice. Then three, those who invite towards that which they practice after having believed in it, and those who are patient in trans- transmitting the message. Okay? So now if we are going to look at the life of Muhammad wasalam, you are going to see either he was a manifestation of what he believed in, in his actions and words, either he was putting into practice, either he was preaching, or either he was being, being patient. That's all you can, subhanAllah, everything you see in the seerah can be what? Can be? Nobody here? Link yes, link back to one of these four things. Okay. So now, 
This is what I would like you to do when you read a book of the seerah, which, which I, I advise you to do, is that when you read the seerah, I want you, not now, to link this to one of these four verses. Was this a manifestation of his belief? Were these actions? Was it preaching? Or was it being patient? Being patient, don't forget, in the deen, is not only being patient with bad things that happen to you. It is also being patient with good things. By not using them against people. By not using them to harm people. By not using them to engage in war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through sinning. So it is very important that you understand that being patient is not only when bad things happen. Being patient is that you share the good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with. You need to be patient for that. No. And as I said this morning in, 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 in my class after Fajr, subhanAllah, it is, for many people it's easier to give 250 pounds when everybody sees him than to give 50 when nobody sees him. Subhanallah. It is easier than 250. You know, when people see you, it's easier than giving 50 away when no one sees you. Of course, not everybody. But subhanallah, this is hajib. So, barakallahu feekum. We are coming now to an end here uh, before we are going to eat some tart and cake, inshallah. And it looks like I am looking forward more than you are. <laughs> but that doesn't matter, does it? So, I, inshallah, we will all enjoy. Um, so, we are coming to a point which I usually do not like to talk about, which is uh, the end of the prophetic life. And some people said that if you talk about his death and it doesn't move your heart nor your eye, that most likely you do not sufficiently love him. Huh? Many people who lost their beloved ones, when they think about their beloved ones, even 20 years later, they are moved. They are moved. So, but I'm going to try to turn a, a sad story into a happier one. I want to look us at uh, to us to have a look at the beauty of it. Okay? Um, I, I, because there is enough sadness. And, and that he left us, sallallahu alayhi wa I can now give you a thunder preach, you know, with lightning and thunder. But this is not what I want to share. Because his life was beautiful. It was the life of a man who lived up to beauty, shared beauty, and died in beauty. Huh? And this is the message that he gave us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because when we look at the very end of his life, subhanAllah, it was a combination between, one, being there for his community, two, being there for his family, three, being dedicated to his Lord. So all of these three things is exactly what he tried to tell us at the end of his life. Three things, not one. It was like everybody would expect a prophet to die in prayer, wouldn't it? Like if you think about a prophet, where is he going to die? You would say in sujood, in the mosque, far away from people, saying, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, that would be the only thing and die. This was not what the mess- how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, died. It all happened when he, when Surat, Iza Jaa Nasrullahi wal Fatih was revealed. Then the Surah, Surah al Fatih. Which says, and when the Fetch, the opening of Mecca, Mecca the, the, when they conquered Mecca, huh? when this happens, and you see that people are entering, embracing Islam in large groups, one after the other, then praise your Lord and beg Him for forgiveness. When this was revealed, the companions were sitting together, and they said, what is this about? They say it was about six months before the Prophet ﷺ died. So now, Umar radiallahu anhu was together with his, compa- with his friends. And Abdullah ibn Abbas arrived. And Umar said, let us ask what Abdullah ibn Abbas understands from these verses. And the other companions were kind of angry. Why? Because Abdullah ibn Abbas was t- still a very young boy, a very young man. And all the, the elders and the peers were sitting there. So they said, well, why is Abdullah ibn Abbas being asked? I mean, we are here, we. And Umar said, let him come. Now he said, what do you understand from this verse, Abdullah ibn Abbas? And he said, what I understand from this verse is that the life 
of, or the death of the Prophet ﷺ is near. And then he went, and then Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu cried, and then he says, I do not have any other opinion apart from the opinion of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Which, is understandable, which we understand because Abdullah ibn Abbas was described by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to be the mufassir of the Qur'an. The one that has been given a correct understanding of the Qur'an. Okay, so now we see this. Then when the people heard this, the Prophet sallallahu took Fatima. Yani he asked Fatima to, to, to come near. And he whispered something in her ear. And she started crying. And then she whispered some, he whispered something else in her ear. And she started smiling. So now Aisha radiallahu anha, who was observing everything, she said, I want to know what's going on. <laughs> so she went to Fatima radiallahu anha. And she said, ya, ya, ya Fatima, what did he say? She said, it is not for me to share his secrets. She said, I will, you know, maybe I will tell you later. So when the Prophet ﷺ died, immediately after that, Aisha radiallahu anha came to Fatima. And she said, Fatima, remember the secret? Now that he died, it is no longer a secret. What did he tell you? She said, first he whispered in my ear that he was about to die. And then I started crying. But then he whispered in my ear again and he said that I would be the first one to join him. So I started smiling. Fatima radiallahu anha is the one they say that she died out of sadness. Because she was so sad uh, that her father passed away that she wasn't able to, to carry this in her heart. No? So, so Fatima radiallahu anha, yani, they say that she resembled, from all people, she was the one that resembled the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than anybody. But when you look at the way that she reacted when her father died, because what we very often forget is that these people were people with emotions. They were people with emotions. That was a father, this was a daughter. Fatherly love it exists. It's not like he's a prophet, so he doesn't love his daughter like a father does. That's not true. He was a human being. As we said at the very beginning. So he had these feelings. Like when Fatima radiallahu anha would come in, he would stand up. And he would give her a hug. Every time she would enter the house, even if when there were guests sitting around him, he would stand up for his daughter, uh, get up for his daughter, and then he would go towards her, hug her, and then he would say, sit on my right side. Sit on my right side. And Aisha radiallahu anha, sometimes when she looked at Fatima, she started crying. And she said, because she's the one that reminds me more from a physical aspect, more of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam than anybody else. She smiles the way he smiled and she walks the way he walked and she talks the way he spoke. So you see that when the Prophet والسلام, left the face of the earth and he was buried and the people they had to you know, cover him or cover the grave rather uh, with sand, fill it, fill, it, fill it up with sand then Fatima radiallahu anha was yelling at those who were doing this meaning that at this particular moment in time she, we, we're not going to say she lost her mind but she was out of her senses for a certain amount of time because it was too hard to cope with. It, it already started when the Prophet ﷺ was in the uh, pains of, of death, uh, which were very strong on the Messenger of, of God ﷺ. Uh, he died also with pain. While he was dying, he said, Inna lil la sakarat. Verily, death comes with its pains. And death comes with its pains. And Aisha radiallahu anha was taking care of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa for a long period of time. She said, I never felt pity for anybody dying after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa because their pain compared to his pain was nothing. When he was sick, he was sick for two people at the same time. Yani he would carry the, the, the pain of more than one person at once. Why? Well, Abdul, uh, Umar, the Prophets are free of sin. But Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu, he used to say, I hope that I, ha- I am in pain the moment I die. We, we are not yani, asking Allah to, you know, to hurt us. We are sane people. 
But they said, why are you saying this, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz? He said, because this is my last opportunity in life to get rid of my sins. So when you're squeezed at the end of your life, maybe every sin is just squeezed out of you. You know, the last drop is gone. So you, you, you meet Allah Jalla ala while there is no sin left in your soul, in your mind, in your ego, in your body, in anything. So now, when Fatima radiallahu anha was sitting next, next to the Messenger of Allah والسلام, she was saying, Ya abata, ya wilata, ya kurbata. And he said, she said, Oh my dear daddy. That's what it means. Ya abata. It means, Oh my dear dad. Ya wilata, how much do I grieve over you? Ya kurbata. Yani, what for a kind of strong affliction this really is? And then the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at Fatima radiallahu anha and he said, do not be sad, don't be sad. He said, because after today, your daddy will never suffer again. You know, your daddy will, won't suffer again, won't suffer ever. So because he suffered all, of, all his life, he was in suffering which he carried in a very noble way. What I take away from the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is a man who never complained, ever. I mean, this is what makes a man a man. I can't pass one single day without complaining about something. The Prophet ﷺ didn't complain about anything. About anything. We complain. You're behind the traffic light, it's red, you know, it takes too much. Well, what's wrong with the traffic lights? Always the same. Oh, traffic jam, London, public transport, whatever. The Prophet ﷺ lost all of his children during his life, apart from Fatima. Anha. All of his other sons and, and daughters died during his life. You never heard him say, Oh, what happened to me? I have lost my children. I have lost my beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha. Why do people expel me? Why did they accuse my wife? Why did they say that I'm a, I'm a magician? Why did they say that I'm a soothsayer? Why, why do they attack me? Why, why, why? Never. Did find one hadith where the companions say that and we came to the Prophet وسلم, and there he was complaining about life. He suffered more than one person, one single person can ever suffer in his life. So now if you, Subhanallah, when, when he was there, he said, Oh my daughter, don't be sad because your daddy won't suffer after today. And this is very important because what I understand from this, very often when you are loved, the moment you die, the people around you are in pain. And if you're a strong person, you are going to put them at ease. You want to tell them, don't worry. I'm going to the hereafter to uh, a forgiving Lord. I'm going to someone that will take care of, care of me. I've been preparing myself all my life for this moment. So please, don't you worry. You see? I leave you, but Allah is there for you. I was maybe providing for you as a mother or a father. But I leave for you, behind me, the provider of all. So when you are a strong person, which is very difficult because when you have your wife or husband crying next to you, your children around you, maybe your grandchildren, all saying, don't leave us, no, what is he doing? You know, subhanAllah. And you are just thinking like, okay, please calm down because I'm about to leave for a world unseen. You know, I'm about to, 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 to enter into a door on a road with no return. I'm about to go into a world where I will stand up for 50,000 years. Where I will be asked about everything I've did in my life. Everything I have said. Every, every person I have falsely accused. Everybody who I've spoken evil about. Everything I have looked at. Everything I have touched. Everything I've heard. Everything. So you sh at that moment it's not very easy. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ was strong until the end. His daughter saying, believe me, she, sometimes we think that it are stories that we see a movie or series on Netflix, you see? That it's, uh, we romant romanticize these stories. Like she was saying, like for example, oh abata, oh kurbata, this is not how it went. It is ya abata, ya. Do you see the difference? 
This is how it goes. But when we read this, we romanticize it and we think that it's a movie. There were genuine feelings of a daughter of a prophet that was about to lose the best dad that ever lived. You know? Now if a daughter imagined her, father's, her father dying, she might go crazy, figuratively speaking. She had a father who exceeded all fathers, not meaning that it won't hurt a daughter now. It will hurt, and it has to hurt. But that was how she was feeling. And then when the people were burying the Messenger of Allah, she, she, she couldn't take it anymore. She started throwing sand at them. She said, are you happy now? SubhanAllah, of course they were not happy. They were all crying. They said, are you happy now that you are burying him? Are you really happy now that you are digging a grave for him? So she was, while throwing the sand, you know, she, she, this is what went on with her. And they say that she would go to his grave every day. And she would cry and cry. And then she said her famous poem. And when she said, the test, what a test, one test, that... I was afflicted with is worse than all the tests that humanity ever have been afflicted with. She said, all these feelings of all afflictions ever were given to me in one night. And then she said, and this affliction turned my joy into sadness and my day into night. And this is what she used to say Every day when she used to visit the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Until she couldn't eat anymore. She couldn't sleep anymore. They were saying, please, you know, take care of yourself. But eventually, her sadness led to her own death. رضي الله تبارك وتعالى عنها أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبعد Fassalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to uh, say once more, once again, that I'm really happy that you made it until the end. Uh, because very often uh, it's always like this. People start out with bigger groups and then these groups you know, become smaller and smaller and smaller. Usually it's like that. And Alhamdulillah, the, the, the group we have here is still a very beautiful, blessed group. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alameen. So it's good, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so um, I, as I was discussing, um, inshallah after Ramadan, we will see if we can also have classes here, which then would be classes in Tafsir. And uh, then we will see, uh, inshallah, how that goes. I will let you know. I have your emails. So then we will keep you updated, inshallah. Um, I, I also have something to mention, but I will do this after the class, inshallah. So good. So what we were mentioning was the Prophet والسلام, and how Fatima radiallahu anha felt Muhtan the young Hevaya. That was Dutch. <laughs> Thank you, Allah. Uh, SubhanAllah. Sometimes I miss, you know, speaking my own language. Do you know why, uh, while I speak in English, I'm actually translating? So while I'm talking, I'm saying this in my language and trying to find words. Even now when I talk, I'm trying to find a word. And very often, it goes like that. You should know, uh, I, uh, not you should know, I'm, I'm a professor at Rotterdam University, right? So sometimes at university, I, I, I speak at another level. That doesn't make me better or worse. But now when I hear myself talk, <laughs> sometimes I speak like a, a 10-year-old child. <laughs> so it's, it's, like, it's like very strange because I, I look at what I want to say and I can only find like 60% of the vocabulary which I need to make my point. And very often people understand me, exactly like you would understand anybody who, who speaks English and you know, gathers word to, words together. And, uh, but it sounds, it's very, very weird. But last time, the weirdest thing which happened to me is that I heard someone speaking, uh, speaking in English 
And I said, oh, he, he speaks my language. So now I knew that I started thinking in English now. So inshallah, within three years, I will be speaking English in a very good way. So, so anyway, so I just want you to know that sometimes I, I look for words. Sometimes my pronunciation is American. Then all of a sudden it becomes British. And then all of a sudden it becomes Jamaican. And then all of a sudden, you see? So, yeah. So, Australian, not yet. So I, sometimes I, I mix everything, you see. So I don't know how this happens, but it happens. So thank you for being so patient with me and accepting me as a non-Brit to talk to you in your language. Okay, Bismillah. Ya Rabbi. So now, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. So everybody focus again, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So now when the Prophet ﷺ, yani he was during, we said that he gathered three things. Who remembers this? Three things. We said we would expect a Prophet to die in the mosque, in sujood, reading his Qur'an, far away from creation, close to creator. But the way someone dies says a lot about the message he wants to convey. Actually, and it's... In particular, when it's a prophet, at the end of his life, he wants to give you the core of his message. He wants to pass on, he wants to put a stamp, as it were, on his life letter. So, how did he do this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How did he do this? Well, we said he combined, one, being good for his family, two, for his community, three, in his worship towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To his family, we've mentioned that he was saying, Fatima radiallahu anha, it's okay, don't worry, don't be sad. But not only this, he also was present at his wife's house and not in the mosque. Um, it was in the room of Aisha radiallahu anha. And at that moment, Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, the son, her, sorry, her brother Abdurrahman came in. And the Prophet ﷺ was with his head on the shoulder or in the arms of his wife. So he was with his head here. And she had her arm around his head comforting him. And, and then he, she would take a, a, a cloth or something, she would a, a kind of tissue which she would wet in and then she would, you know over his head and over his hands and feet and so forth. So anyway, while he was laying down like that, um, Abdurrahman came in, the, the brother of Aisha radiallahu anha, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at her brother. And her brother had a new siwak, a fresh one. And he, st- he kept on looking at the siwak. And then Aisha radiallahu anha says, and I knew that he loved the siwak. I knew that he loved the siwak. So I took the siwak, the miswak. You know the siwak? You can call it siwak, miswak. It's the, uh, the wooden... Uh, yes. And then she said, so what I did, I chewed on it. That's the way you do it. Very often, barakallahu feekum, I, I, I'm so disgusted by people not knowing how to use the siwak. People, they put... They think that a siwak is there to use for ages. A siwak, with every prayer, you cut it. This is how the Arabs used to do it. They would use it, cut it. Use it, cut it. What do people now do? They use it, put it in their... How do you call this? Pocket. And then they use it again, put it in their pocket, but also in a plastic thing. So it starts smelling. Bacteria is there. And actually what people forget is that a siwak is a toothbrush. So the Arabs, that was the toothbrush of the Arabs. So now we are actually walking around, going around with toothbrushes, brushing our teeth in front of the people because we say it's sunnah. But we don't look at the way that the Prophet ﷺ used to, used to use his siwak. He said, before the wudu, yes, because you're cleaning your mouth. So before the wudu, you know, you do it gently, and, and, and you don't do it in front of the people. Can you imagine yourself, me now having a siwak during my dust and doing like this? 
You would even think, MashaAllah, the Shaykh has a siwak. He's following the Sunnah. Shaykh is brushing his teeth in front of you. <laughs> you know? So, so what, it should be something discreet. Like you put your hand, like Ibn Abdul Bar said in his book at Tamheed, and he also mentioned this in his book Al-Istithkar. He said like, if you use, when you use the siwak, you hide it behind your hand. And you go gently. He even said, and don't do it in the mosque. Because when you use it in the mosque, wooden things can fall down on the, on, on, on the carpet. It would be like a part of your toothbrush, some of your toothbrush hairs falling down on the carpet of the mosque. And a bit of Colgate and a bit of, I don't know what. This, this doesn't make sense. So I said, do it before you enter the mosque. And if you don't, yani, and do it behind your hand. People don't even know how the Prophet ﷺ used to take his siwak. SubhanAllah. This isn't the siwak, by the way. <laughs> Neither a cigarette or anything. I'm doing like this. So, he used to take it like this. See? Do you see this? So, this is the way that they used to do it. So, you have... Uh, this is a strange sign today. So, you put it between this. You see this? And then he would go like this. And nobody would see it. He wouldn't just go in the mosque like that. So this is very important. That we should know that some of the things we call sunnah are in the first place the sunnah of ada, A sunnah of um, habit. Right? So they would use the siwak. Why? Because that was the best thing to clean your teeth in those days. No? Doesn't mean that we don't use it. If you like to use it, use it. But use it properly. Not like here is Sunnah. Now, even, do you know Colgate made Colgate with Siwak? Everything becomes Islamic. Halal toothpaste, halal makeup. Did you hear of halal makeup? What? There is now halal makeup. The halal makeup in such a way, which is good. One, it is free of najis, of, of, of impurities, which are impure according to Islam. And um, it's not tested on animals. But then the other thing, they say, if you put it on, like your, whatever you put on your face, and then you wash it, it doesn't form a layer between your skin and the water. Which is one of the reasons why makeup wouldn't be allowed. Uh, when you perform wudu, you should take it off. Uh, when you're at, at home, you, uh, you take it off, and then you wash your face. But if there is a layer and the water doesn't touch your skin, then your wudu is not valid. This would be the same for a man using cream which forms a layer between his skin and the water. You can feel it. Like put, when you go home, put some olive oil on your hand and then you will see when the water goes over your hand, your skin doesn't feel the water. It is a layer. So now they also have halal makeup. And then they have halal, tooth, halal toothpaste. Then they have halal everything. So people turned it into, into a trade. And very often we want to see the word halal. There where normally it is halal. But we want to see it or we want to call it Islamic. Because we are so not occupied with our religion. That we want to attach ourselves to everything which sounds religious. You see? Instead of being it. So don't get into this thing. Uh, so anyway, why did I say this? Because the Prophet ﷺ used the siwak. <laughs> so now the Prophet ﷺ, he used the siwak, right? And so he saw it, so he took it in the way that he used to hold on to his siwak. And, he, and then Aisha radiallahu anha says, and then he, cleans, he cleaned his teeth so thoroughly that I thought I, have, I had never before seen him doing this. In the same way. He was really cleaning his mouth like better than he would ever do. And he would always do it in a good way. And then, then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so he was in the arms of his wife. Then he was cleaning his, his mouth. And then he reminded people and he said, fear Allah in the way that you treat women. That were one of his last words. He said, fear God in the way that you treat women. And then, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he looked at the sky and pointed to the sky. And then he said, Allahumma fi rafiq al-a'la. 
He said, Oh Allah, take me to the highest degree in paradise. And then Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his soul left his body. So now you see that the Prophet ﷺ, one, he was in worship, cleaning himself, preparing himself to die in the most beautiful way. Two, he was good to his daughter and his wife. Three, he was making dua. Four, he was good for his community, reminding them that, sorry, he said two things, your prayer, your prayer, and the way you treat your wives. Prayer and being good to your wife. And he didn't say your husbands, your husbands. <laughs> he said your wives. You see? Because that is where very often you know, people go wrong. More than women go wrong towards the husband. So now, the Prophet ﷺ, if we look at his message, he said one, prayer. Two, being good for your wife. Why? Why do you think that? You know, they are like a symbol for something. They stand figuratively for something. For what? Prayer for connection with Allah. Yani, don't forget your connection with Allah Almighty. And being good for your wife, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, the best ones amongst you, is amongst you men, is the one who is best for his wife. Why? Because when you are with your wife, you are being you. You know, at the very beginning of your marriage, maybe the first three weeks, three months, you are not being you. You are being a prince. Out of a story of Snow White. Hmm? And then uh, Cinderella, these kind of princes. And then, you know, when, when she just want to, wants to stand up, you say, should I take a chair? She wants to get in the car, should I open the door? She wants to carry, you don't want her even to carry, you know, your, a phone. She says, darling, I will carry this for you. <laughs> Ten months later, there she is, coming back from Lidl. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love stuff. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, everybody, keep it for yourself. <laughs> so, when you see that at the very beginning, you are showing an image, which is normal, because otherwise, if you show who you really are from the very beginning, you won't get married. <laughs> so, to be, but to be quite frank, you know, we are not perfect. We have our shortcomings and mistakes. But when the Prophet ﷺ said, the best one amongst you men is the one who is best for his wife. If you are patient, you are generous, you are helpful, you are trustworthy, you don't break, break promises, you don't break heart towards your wife, then you are a good person. Because that is where we first go wrong. Like if, if you're not generous, your wife will know before your brothers. When you're with your brothers, say, brother, should I buy you a snack? Yeah, but you, you paid last time. Brother, this is for Allah. And then when you come back home, and your wife says, did you bring something for me? And then you say, we've got something in the fridge. You see what I mean? So being generous, if you're being more generous to your brothers and to your wife, you're not generous. If you're being more patient with your brothers than, to, than with your wife, not patient. You see this? If you're more helpful with brothers than with your wife, you're not helpful. This is why he said, be good to your wife. Because if you are able to be good to your wife, you're a good, true, sincere, genuine Muslim. And if you're not good to your wife, and you're good to the entire world, you're not a good person. Because that person is not you. Home is where the masks fall, and where faces are unveiled. Done. So this is what he said, be a sincere Muslim. Be true to who you are and to what your religion stands for and connect to God. With these two things, being good to your wife, yani a genuine Muslim, and connecting to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Almighty, through your prayer, deen will be established. These two things, sincerity and connection to God, turn every Muslim into the best version of himself. You see this? Allah. <laughs> but now, of course, the men are saying, but what about women? <laughs> uh, well, the Prophet ﷺ, when uh, a lady came to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, she said, my husband this, my husband that. He said, watch out 
for how you treat your husband because he can be your hellfire and he can be your paradise. So it's in both ways. Yani it's a two-direction street, you see. But men very often are... Yes. They, they use their physical power. You know, their physical strength very often. And they feel that they are stronger. So anyway, when I look at the Messenger وسلم, we said about preaching or doing what he preached, Aisha radiallahu anha said, look, she said, when the Prophet وسلم, would be at home, كان في مهنة أهله. he would be at the disposal of his wife. Oh, go to the grocery store, go to this, do that, come back. You shouldn't think that Aisha radiallahu anha said, she's the Prophet وسلم. No, she used to become sometimes angry with the Prophet وسلم. Sometimes she would be suspicious of him. While there was no reason for it. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Aisha, I know when you're angry with me and when you are not. And then he said, How, how do you know, O oh, oh, Messenger of God? She said, Well, when you are happy and happily in love with me, and she was always in love, when you're happy with me, then you say, I swear by the Lord of Muhammad. And when you're angry with me, you say, I swear by the Lord of Ibrahim. <laughs> And then she said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. She said, yes, this is true. But the only thing which I'm avoiding is mentioning your name. Yani with her tongue, but not with her heart. You see? So she, she would sometimes get angry. You know? So she was a wife. And, 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 and the wife sometimes get angry, exactly like a man, husband, and so forth. So anyway, so she said that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was at service to his wife when he would be at home. But look now. She said, but when it was time to pray, he didn't know anybody. If he would leave the house and she would say, oh, could you please do this or that? You know, clean something. This is what she would ask. She would ask him, could you clean? Could you do this? this?" And this this is a form of worship for her husband. You know, when, when, you, when you help at home, I have the problem, my wife is here. <laughs> so when you, when you, so uh, imagine, huh? So, <laughs> so when, when you're at home as a husband and you, you help. So Aisha radiallahu anha said, the messenger of, of Allah, he used to be at service to his wife. She said he would, you know, when repair his own clothing. He would clean. He would do so many different things. But when it was time to pray, he didn't know anybody. Look once again, being perfect, a perfect husband. But when it was time to connect to God through prayer, he would leave everything behind him. That was his life. But look, when he would leave the mosque, what would he do? Once again, combining prayer with being good for family. She said then when the Prophet ﷺ would leave for the mosque. I'm sorry to say this, sometimes when, when you mention love in, in a mosque or an imam spe- mentions love, then people say, Astaghfirullah, is there love in Islam? Yes, a lot. <laughs> yes. The Messenger ﷺ said, Oh Allah, I ask you for your love. And I ask you to make me love those who love you. And I ask you to make me love the deeds that bring me closer to your love. And oh Allah, make loving you more beloved to me the loving cold water going through my dry throat. Yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, the strongest, strongest connection of faith is Alhubbulillah, is loving one another for Allah's sake. You see? So this love is there. The Prophet ﷺ said, like in Bukhari, you will not taste the sweetness of faith until you love Allah and His Messenger more than anybody else. And until you love your brother and sister more, yani for the sake of Allah. And then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and on the day of judgment, Allah will say, where are those who loved one another for my sake? Today I will grant them shadow, and today there is no shadow apart from my shadow. And the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, on the day of judgment, there will be people, and the prophets will envy these people. They said, who are they, Ya Rasulullah? He said, they are people from different nations, and different tribes, and different backgrounds, that used to, one, that used to visit one another, that used to give presents to one another, and that used to love one another. And their clothes will be light, and their faces will be illuminated on the Day of Judgment. And they will not fear when other people fear. A man went to visit his brother, 
And an angel came on his road, on his path, and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm visiting this man. He said, why? Because I love him for Allah's sake. He said, then, t then Allah tells you that he loves you because you loved him. So love is a part of our deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَّدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ and those, who, uh, and those who believe their love is stronger for Allah than the love of others for other things. So, so yes, love. Why am I saying this? When the Prophet ﷺ used to go to the mosque, he would give a kiss to his wife on her cheek. It's a, a friendly one. Assalamualaikum. And then he would go to the mosque. He would not go out. See you later. Boom. Where are you going, Dalif? After 10 years of marriage, where are you going? Doesn't matter. You know? No, no. He, he, when you, will you be back? <laughs> Allah. Yes. But if you love your wife and your wife loves you, then you want to be home soon. And that's usually at the very beginning. But some marriages, they are filled with love from the very beginning until the very end. And that, that exists without any doubt. They said, uh, we asked scholars, and how does one do this? He said, by being the same person you were in the, during the three first weeks of your marriage. If you keep on holding up to these values, and, 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 and like I was saying, carrying the bags, opening the door, taking the chairs, you know, if you keep on doing this, then love will, will not decrease. It will stay the same. You know? And you might think that this is too idealistic, it isn't, because it's your biggest form of worship apart from prayer, being good to your wife. Okay? Let's continue. It's almost finished, and then the thoughts are there. <laughs> Allah. So he left three things when he died, alayhi salatu wasalam. One thing was his community, and told them, be genuine and connect to God. He was good to his wife. He didn't die in sujood. He died in the arms of his wife. So as I said at the very beginning, you would expect a prophet to die while prostrating, but he died in the arms of his wife. This is a message, Yani. So Hala, a prophet dies in the most honored place on earth. Allah wouldn't allow him to, to have a dishonored death. This is honor. He's pointing towards the sky, making a dua, and his wife is caressing his head, and then, you know, his soul leaves his body. So, if you want to know what the status of a woman in Islam is, then look at the fact that he didn't die while praying, but that he died in the arms of his wife. That is where he chose to die. Because prophets die where they choose to die. The Prophet ﷺ said, Okay? Okay. Is this clear? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So the last thing I want to mention is after when the Prophet ﷺ passed away that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum thought it was a dream and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would resurrect him and, and that he didn't really die. Until, yani, until Umar radiallahu anhu came to the mosque and then he said, anybody who tells me that the Prophet of Allah died, I will, call, you know, I will, I will kill him. So that was his state. But that was a way that the Arabs used to say, I will beat him. It didn't really mean killing, but beating doesn't make it less. Huh? But that was his state of mind. Like, don't tell it. Don't dare. So people stopped saying it until Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came. And he took, you know, the, 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 the garment uh, of, away from the face of the Prophet wasalam, And then he kissed on his forehead. And then he said his very known words. مَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ مُحَمَّدًا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ مَاتْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتْ If someone amongst you was worshipping Muhammad, then know that Muhammad has died. And if you were worshipping Allah, then know that Allah is the everlasting and will never die. And this is when all the people understood that Muhammad had died. Because he referred to the verse, he said this on the mimbar. He was the first one to stand on the mimbar. You know? And then he said, 
وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ And Muhammad is but a messenger. And before him, him there were messengers. If he dies of he, or when, if he were to be killed, would you leave your faith? This is a verse in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ You will certainly die, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they will die as well. And then Umar radiallahu anhu said, it was as if I heard this verse for the very first time in my life. And then people calmed down, and they knew that was done. They said that they heard the tears through all the streets of Medina. And then after they buried him, Bilal, who was the muaddin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he left Medina. He left Medina. Uh, because a lot of, a lot of uh, sahaba couldn't stay at Medina. Because you know that if you remain in a place where you have many memories, then everything you see reminds you of the one you, you lost, right? And for some it's good, for some they can't handle it. Some people don't want to let go. I know that my grandmother, who's still alive, she's, she will turn 95, uh, if, inshallah, if Allah grants her life, on, on the 27th of August. And um, when my grandfather died, you know, they were married for more than 60 years. Six zero. More than 60 years of marriage. And um, when my grandfather passed away, she wasn't able to let go of some of his clothes. She would sometimes put them in the chair, watch television, and just seeing his clothes there would give her comfort, bring her comfort, and would, you know, calm her down. And at the very beginning, she, she didn't feel like giving me any, and I didn't want to, anything of his clothes or, or cravats or, you know, costumes, or he had the same size as me. And um, that took about, I think, five years, five years before she did this. And until, until lately when she gave me away, when she gave me a lot of the things that she held on to for more than 10 years. She said, there you go, this is for you, this is for you. So it took a very long time. So some people can't handle it, and some people need it. Because they feel that t t giving it away, or leaving that place, is like saying goodbye forever. So this was Bilal radiallahu anhu, he wanted to go. He was reminded of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam, Especially because he had to do the call for, to prayer. Uh, and some years later, Bilal radiallahu anhu had a dream where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into his dream and he said, Oh Bilal, hasn't the time come for you to visit me? So he knew that when you see the Prophet alayhi wa in your dream, it is true. This is what you need to know. Prophet alayhi wa sallam said, Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani haqqa. The one that saw me in a dream has truly seen me. This is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet ﷺ was allowed to visit you in your dream. Okay? So now, he said, okay. So he went to Medina. When he arrived at Medina, people asked him to perform the adhan. Because they missed his voice. You know, it was a long time ago. So he just said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You know, two times. And then he started crying. He couldn't finish the adhan. And they say that all the people came out of the houses of Medina that lived in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. People were falling down on their knees. Other people started crying. And everywhere in Medina there was sadness. Because this reminded them so much of the death of the Prophet ﷺ, the ones that they loved. And then Bilal ﷺ said, I will never again you know, make the call to prayer in my life. And he, he wasn't able to do it. No, then, then, then he left Medina once again. So you see that the, the people were very close to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the, the main reason why they were so fond of him and why they loved him so much is because he gave more love to people than he gave to himself. He felt the pain of people more. He would prefer to experience pain and removing your pain than to remove his pain and you remain in your pain. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described him in the Quran. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ يعني رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ are names of Allah, but Allah describes him as being رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah describes the Messenger of Allah as رَعُوفُ and رَحِيم عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ meaning your pain hurts him. So it, it would have been like if, if, if my finger hurts me, I'm going to take care of it. Now, when you are hurt, 
He would experience your pain, so he would do everything to remove your pain, because he felt it more than you did. This was his love and his mercy for the companions, radiallahu ta'baraka wa ta'ala anhum. And this is why when people would knock, knock on his door and say, Ya Rasulullah, do you have milk? And he wouldn't have milk and wouldn't have money to buy milk. Then he would ask someone to borrow him some money. Then he would buy the milk for this person. And then he would gradually pay that person back. Like someone knocking on your door. Uh, do you have, I don't know, some shoes for me? You don't have them? You go. You don't have money? You ask somebody, can you 50 pounds give you back next month? You buy these Nike, uh, Nike Air Jordans for him. And then you, you pay this every month, 50 pounds, 150 pounds, there you go. This is how the Messenger of Allah والسلام, would do it with everybody. When people would leave their houses during the night because they were hungry, they would come out and find the Prophet والسلام, being more hungry than they were. When someone had to attach a stone to his stomach, like what they would do, not, not to experience hunger too much, they would put a stone on their, belly, on their stomach and then they would tie it. So that it would push on their, on their stomach. They said, when we used to attach one stone, and we said, are you hungry, Ya Rasulullah? And he lifted his garment, we saw that he had two stones attached. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, were very poor. One day visited the Messenger of God, والسلام, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we are hungry. We only have bread. We have nothing but bread. They said, and Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa said, me too. And then he, he told us to join him. The bread, they say, was harder than a rock. Our bread was soft. His bread was harder than a rock. And he would soak it or wetten it in water. And only then would he be able to eat it. But we, when we wanted to eat it, we felt that it was about to break our teeth. So the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was in, always in a situation which was less than the situation of his companions. And yes, he would make money. Yes, he would. When you count everything he bought in his life, you will see that he was very well off. But that everything which he bought, he gave away. Like a companion would come and say, Ya Rasulullah, I love your cloak. There you go. Ya Rasulullah, I, I love your turban. Okay, here you are. Ya Rasulullah, I, lo I love your cane. There you go, take my cane. I love your camel, there, take my camel. This is, so the, the companions would become angry with people doing this. They said, why are you doing this? You know that when you say it, that he will give it. And then the companion said, the only reason why I asked him for his cloak is because I want to be buried in it. You know, and that was eventually the garment that he was buried in. You know, the, the, the tissue he was buried in. So if you're going to see yani, the companions, radiallahu anhum, they, they saw that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, he was you know, taking care of them more than he was taking care of himself. And, and he will do this even in the hereafter. You know, he won't say, okay, my duty is finished, there I go, go to paradise, see you later. Not at all. He, he will not enter paradise until everybody who has to get out of hellfire will get out of hellfire and get into paradise. And only when all the inhabitants of paradise are in paradise, only then will he enter paradise. He said, if you are looking for me, don't forget this. He said, if you are looking for me on the day of judgment, I'm either at the bridge, either at the scales, or either at the gates of hell asking Allah to set people free. So when you look for him on the day of judgment, look, look at, at these, you know, these three places. You will find him there. And when, when people will pass the bridge, he will say, Allahumma ummati, ummati. Oh Allah, my community, my community. Oh Allah, have mercy for them. So even on the day of judgment, his job is not finished. No? So his job is not finished. Then he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, will stand at the Haud. He will stand at the Haud. And the Haud is a lake. And he will give people to drink from this lake. And those who drink from it will never be thirsty again. So he will be at the lake serving people. There you go. Drink. Drink. Billions of people. He will serve them. 
So you see, he, he's, his job, his job isn't finished. Even when he's in his grave, remember? If you do bad, he asks Allah to forgive you. And when you do good, he asks Allah to what? He praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even after his physical death, he's still of benefit for us. And in the hereafter, this will continue until he rests when he enters paradise in the highest level. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let us serve the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa not worship, serve the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa through serving his community. That's the best way. If you want to know how you can pay him back, which you never can, then that which gets most closest, uh, closest to it is serving his community. Being patient, endurant, guiding them, taking away from ignorance to knowledge, from fear to safety, from war to peace, from tears to smiles. So, so this is the way that you can do something for him between brackets because you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to inspire us through his life and to make everything we have heard in the past weeks inshallah beneficial for us to make the best day of our lives the day that we die to make our time in, on the face of the earth like fasting and our meeting with him like Eid and to never show us hellfire to ne- uh, never let us enter hellfire, to make us a sort of source of guidance. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us under his shadow on the day of judgment. And that we inshallah are safeguarded against the punishment of hell. Inna huwa liyu thalik wal qadiru alayh wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. I thank you. Okay, that was the end. <laughs> so, um, I will keep you updated, inshallah. I, I would like to go over tafsir and maybe some other things here. I will keep you updated. Now let us, you know, for 15 minutes, enjoy some cake, some tea, some coffee. And please, don't forget me, your God. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants me knowledge and practice. Amen.